In June 1992, Chicago enacted an ordinance which made it illegal to loiter in public with any person the police suspected to be in a gang. The ordinance defined loitering as, quote, remaining in any one place for no apparent reason, unquote, and gave police the power to arrest anyone who did not immediately obey an order to disperse. By 1995, the Chicago Police Department was making 22,000 arrests every year under this statute, mostly for no other offense than simply standing on a public street. This new law was part of a greater national policing trend, commonly known as broken windows policing, which took the U.S. by storm in the 1990s. Nearly all evidence since has suggested that the broken window strategy does nothing to reduce crime, and yet it remains the dominant policing paradigm in the United States. Today, we will discuss how far from being a mere crime-fighting strategy, broken windows policing and the carceral state it created are central to the story of the modern city in the US and abroad. Let's get started. Broken Windows Theory, first posited in a 1982 article by political scientist James Q. Wilson, stemmed from his observation that, quote, if a window in a building is broken and left unrepaired, all the rest of the windows will soon be broken, unquote. Wilson claims that this is because, quote, one unrepaired broken window is a signal that no one cares, and so breaking more windows costs nothing, unquote. He further argued that the same could be said of what he termed disorder more generally. If minor disorder, like the presence of graffiti or public drug use, was tolerated in a community, this would embolden hardened criminals and eventually lead to more serious crime. This claim was largely a theoretical curiosity until 1993, when newly elected mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani adopted it into practice. This is what broken windows theory is all about! The NYPD began to aggressively pursue arrests for minor offenses like graffiti writing, panhandling, and loitering, with a 2014 study estimating that the annual arrest rate for minor crimes nearly tripled under the new policy. Chicago soon followed suit, and as crime rates plummeted throughout the 90s, the new policies were hailed as a huge success. By 1998, 200 police departments were sending representatives to the NYPD every year to learn its methods and replicate them in their own cities. But the costs of this were also immediately obvious. As police were encouraged to arrest people for minor offenses that were once either ignored or handled informally, the US correctional population, including those on probation, began to swell from 2 million in the 1980s to 7 million by 2015, by far the highest rate anywhere in the world. Wilson had actually recommended stricter minimum sentences and greater use of incarceration for misdemeanor offenders, and by 2002, 46% of US inmates were non-violent criminals, especially drug users. This is especially tragic as evidence began to pile up that broken windows policing wasn't actually responsible for the collapse in US crime rates. Researchers began to note that crime rates had fallen in nearly every American city, whether or not broken windows policies had actually been adopted. A 2015 study notes that San Diego had adopted a crime strategy based on community policing and neighborhood watches instead and had actually seen a steeper decline in murder than either New York or Chicago. A 2006 paper found that not only had nearly every existing study found no evidence for broken windows policing actually reducing crime rates, but also conducted its own study, which tracked nearly 5,000 people in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Boston, and Baltimore. It concluded that there was, quote, no support for a simple first-order disorder crime relationship as hypothesized by Wilson and Kelly, nor for the proposition that broken windows policing is the optimal use of scarce law enforcement resources." Unquote. We probably shouldn't be too surprised by this, because the original Broken Windows article contained no actual evidence. I've linked an archive in the description that I encourage you to read, 
But Wilson never cites a single statistic, empirical study, or specific academic authority that this strategy works. The article is full of weasel phrases like social psychologists and police officers tend to agree, and strung out hypotheticals about how weeds growing in an abandoned yard somehow transform a neighborhood into an inhospitable and frightening jungle. Evidence is limited to anecdotes from interviews and an unscientific study from the 60s. On its face, the essay should have been completely unconvincing to any criminologist. In fact, even Wilson seems unconvinced. In a 2004 interview, he stated that, quote, I still to this day do not know if improving order will or will not reduce crime, unquote, and emphasized that his theory was really more a hypothesis or speculation. Yet, broken windows policing remains incredibly popular, and has even been exported abroad. Anti-social behavior orders are commonly issued to loitering teens in the UK, while a 2019 study documents the adoption of broken windows policing in post-Soviet countries like Ukraine and Kazakhstan. A 2017 study reports how as recently as 2013, Detroit paid $600,000 to the conservative Manhattan Institute to develop a broken windows policing strategy, even as the city itself prepared to declare bankruptcy. Why is broken windows policing still so popular, in spite of its well-documented failure to actually reduce crime? Perhaps, as some researchers have argued, this is because broken windows policies are in fact spectacularly successful, not towards crime reduction, but other, broader social and economic goals. And for this reason, they remain popular even with liberal politicians. Let's look at the evidence. In 2016, CUNY law professor and former New York public defender K. Babe Howell wrote that while broken window policing's explicit purpose is to make public space safe enough that ordinary people feel comfortable there, in practice it quote, makes public space very, very dangerous for black people, Latino people, poor people, LGBTQ people, people with substance abuse problems, people with mental health problems, and homeless people. Unquote. In fact, Howell considers broken windows policing a misnomer, preferring the phrase zero tolerance policing. If we took Wilson's essay at face value, Howell writes, then quote, we would be fixing broken windows, we would be replacing broken light bulbs, we would be repairing broken doors and broken elevators in public housing, we would be improving parks and schools and our after school programs in underserved communities. We would be making our public spaces safe by addressing unsafe conditions." Unquote. Instead, the broken windows era has been defined by the defunding of public housing, of schools, and of social programs, and the increasing diversion of city resources to outrageous police budgets. So why does broken windows policing so often avoid cleaning up the literal broken windows in so many urban neighborhoods? The answer, as suggested by cultural theorist Fred Morton, is that broken windows policing in fact intends to remove, quote, people who are themselves broken windows, those who make others uncomfortable, unquote. This is evident when we look at how broken windows policing is actually enforced in practice. Howell claims that in New York alone, the broken window strategy was responsible for at least 2 million excess arrests between 1993 and 2013, mostly for non-violent misdemeanors. Minorities are especially targeted, with a 2016 paper reporting that nearly half of those arrested for cannabis possession in New York are black, even though they make up only a quarter of the population and cannabis is used at similar rates by all racial groups. This aggressive policing is frequently deadly. Michael Brown was killed by police in Ferguson after being stopped for jaywalking, while Eric Garner was killed by NYPD officers for selling loose cigarettes, both minor and non-violent offenses that are explicitly targeted by broken windows enforcement. More broadly, broken windows policing has manifested as constant police harassment of minorities and the poor. At its height in 2011, New York's stop-and-frisk program, 
which was later ruled unconstitutional, was detaining more than half a million people every year, mostly minorities. That African Americans and Hispanics make up 52% of the city's population, but Black and Latino males represent 84% of those stopped. And on the West Coast, it is now common policy for cities to break up homeless encampments and destroy the belongings of residents. In Detroit, the ACLU has documented police picking up homeless people downtown and seizing any cash they have before dumping them near city limits, while Los Angeles regularly deports the homeless from affluent areas to dumping grounds like Skid Row. Of the $100 million Los Angeles budgets towards homelessness, over 80% goes to the city's police department, leaving little for housing, mental health treatment, or other solutions that would actually solve homelessness. In fact, a 2018 paper highlights how policing solutions to homelessness actually make the problem worse, since constant harassment and confiscations make it difficult to access shelter, health services, and financial support. Quote, Order maintenance policing practices ultimately reproduce the very signifiers of disorder that they aim to abate. Unquote. So, broken windows policing is less about reducing crime and more about what historian Mike Davis calls containment, removing the poor, the homeless, and minorities from the city center and containing them in outlying neighborhoods. In fact, Former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani just came out and said this, stating that getting poor people to leave New York was, quote, not an unspoken part of our strategy, that was our strategy, unquote. This containment can be quite literal. A 2008 study documents how, as a condition of misdemeanor probation, Seattle and other cities now commonly issue off-limits orders that prevent offenders from entering downtown at all unless they can prove they live or work there. These harsh policing strategies are often counterproductive on their face. As Thompson points out, Broken Windows policing, quote, shifts police officers from focusing on serious crimes to making arrests for minor offenses, unquote. In spite of decades of rising police budgets, in 2016 only 29% of murders in Chicago were solved, compared to 93% in London and 95% in Japan during the same period. In the poorest parts of New York City, this rate can be as low as 20%, even as US police budgets overall have nearly tripled since the 1970s. Police clearly have other things on their minds. Instead. The motive behind this change in policing strategy was similar to what we discussed in the mollification video several months ago. After decades of demographic and economic decline, many former industrial cities have managed to reinvent themselves as centers of the service economy and luxury consumption. This is the famous urban renaissance that began in the 90s. Young professionals began moving in droves to cities from London and Manchester to Chicago and Seattle in order to staff booming finance, tech, and other white-collar sectors, while new stadiums, malls, and luxury high-rises transformed decaying downtowns into playgrounds for both their global rich and suburban tourists. All of these groups would spend money and pay taxes within city limits, creating a new, non-industrial economic base for post-industrial cities. But these newly revitalizing cities had a distinct disadvantage compared to the wealthy suburbs around them. All of the social problems and inequalities present in our society, like widespread poverty, de facto racial segregation, drug use, and homelessness, were obviously present to anyone wandering urban streets. Their presence wasn't dangerous per se, but it was uncomfortable to a middle class accustomed to suburban life where long distances and high property prices kept undesirables out of sight. If cities wanted to lure in white collar workers and suburban tourists, they needed to get rid of the source of this discomfort. The panhandlers, drunks, addicts, rowdy teenagers, prostitutes, loiterers, and mentally disturbed that Wilson cites in his essay. But here cities faced another problem. As Dr. Bernard Harcourt of Columbia Law puts it, quote, the disorderly were merely the losers of society, a nuisance to many, but not threatening or dangerous, unquote. Behaviors like loitering or panhandling, quote, were, for many, a nuisance, 
irritating, particularly since they reminded many of us of our privilege, but something simply to ignore." Unquote. For better or worse, the disorderly had once just been accepted as part of city life. Now, however, municipal governments wanted to get rid of, for example, the homeless, but they couldn't legally arrest them just because they were there. In fact, as recently as 2019, the Ninth Circuit Court ruled that cities could not criminalize homelessness itself, since it was neither constitutional nor moral to punish people for something often outside of their control. This is where broken windows policing came in. According to Wilson, drug addicts, sex workers, and everybody else that made the new urban middle class uncomfortable aren't merely a nuisance. By increasing the perception of disorder, rowdy teens and public drunks encouraged more violent criminals to assault or murder, and so dealing with the slightest sign of disorder was absolutely critical, allegedly, to tackle serious crime. Wilson even admits that these people aren't dangerous or criminals themselves, but stated that they still had to be cracked down on to address real crime. Cities now had an excuse to eliminate the homeless and anybody else that broke the illusion of order and prosperity from their city centers. Social problems that once either had to be addressed or explicitly ignored could now instead be policed into extinction. And if some homeless people, or sex workers, or minorities died in the process, that was just the price of economic rebirth. In the words of Dr. Harcourt, cities created an illusion of order just good enough to comfort those with money. As documented in a 2008 paper, deindustrialization has, quote, led many cities to compete with each other to create the most hospitable environment for corporate investment and headquarters, luxury living facilities, tourism, and retail operations." Unquote. The author cites communications researcher Timothy Gibson, who emphasizes that the broken windows model is part of a broader program of projects of reassurance. After the vast majority of American wealth packed up for the suburbs from the 50s onwards, municipal governments needed to, quote, counter widespread images of cities as sites of decay and danger with sanitized images of urban consumer utopias, unquote. The poor and homeless, who are often minorities, do not mesh with this image, and broken windows policing provides both a means and justification to remove them from the picture even as cities pour huge amounts of funding into projects aimed to turn cities into middle-class playgrounds. Perhaps the most egregious case is Hudson Yards, a recently completed luxury mega-development in New York, which received over a billion dollars of public funding intended for low-income communities which was accomplished by absurdly gerrymandering it together with public housing projects on the other side of Manhattan. More broadly, police funding in the US across the board has grown for decades even in liberal cities, in spite of a lack of evidence that the increased funding actually addresses urban crime. Some cities made cuts in 2020, but they were often trivial. For example, while Boston agreed to cut police funding from $414 million to only $404 million in 2021, this is still nearly $100 million more than Boston police were given in 2012. By 2021, some cities had begun to reverse even these cuts. Even as experts were quick to point out that crime had risen in all cities and was completely uncorrelated with previous decreases in funding. The real reason is simple. As Herbert and Beckett put it, quote, The appeal of broken windows policing to urban developers and city officials is obvious. It promises to aid the revitalization of urban downtowns. Unquote. While it has had little effect on crime, Broken Windows policing has generally accomplished its goal of sacrificing the poor and disorderly of our cities in exchange for economic and demographic growth. After decades of decline, Central Detroit has seen $10 billion in new investment between 2006 and 2016 as companies set up offices downtown, even as barely a quarter of the new 
well-paying professional jobs went to residents of the city itself. While decades of population decline have finally stabilized as thousands of white-collar professionals move into the central city from Detroit's wealthy white suburbs. By 2019, New York City was home to over 1 million millionaires, even as the homeless population doubled over the previous decade. Under Rahm Emanuel, major companies like McDonald's, Kraft Heinz, and Motorola moved their headquarters to central Chicago, even as the mayor shut down half of the city's mental health clinics and covered up a police murder of a black teen. The policy of containment, as Davis described it, has worked as well. In Chicago, the vast majority of murders now occur in the city's west and far south sides, far away from the commercial and tourist centers in the Loop. A similar pattern is apparent in nearly every American city. Across the post-industrial West, cities have been transformed into malls where the wealthy and middle classes can live, work, and play. With the police gating off this new urban playground from anyone and anything that might break this illusion. And it is an illusion. Even though American inflation-adjusted per capita GDP has nearly doubled between 1980 and 2020, the poverty rate has barely budged. One in five American children lives below the poverty line. In cities like Chicago, this number increases to more than one in four. The racial income gap has actually grown over the last four decades, with black workers earning 80% of the median white wage in 1979, but only 76% by 2019. Over half a million Americans are homeless, and another 2 million are imprisoned, mostly for nonviolent offenses, including 1 in 10 young black men. In short, even as our society is wealthier than ever, many of our social problems have gone unresolved or even gotten worse in our lifetimes. Instead, those in charge have tried to create an illusion of prosperity in our society, an illusion of order in our cities, an illusion of meritocracy in our schools, all intended more to alleviate the discomfort of our wealthiest at the expense of nearly everybody else. In many cities, this project has succeeded. Thanks for watching.